Okay, so you can start the meeting now. For the presentation now. Okay. Greetings, everyone. This is Bill Ricker. Uh, I'm the usual entertainment for our annual uh, key signing party. And for reasons that are probably obvious to everybody, we aren't doing an in-person key signing this month or year. Um, and we will discuss whether to do it next year or not. But I'm happy to continue doing uh, cryptography history uh, reviews uh, as often as anyone cares for them. Uh, both of the history as she has written what happened in the last year and a vignette from from history. And well, the news will intertwine with the history this time. As usual, I'll do the new news history as she's written first and then the historical vignette. But there'll be some history mixed into that also. There have been some interesting cracks this year. Most of them were dull, but the raccoon crack that uh, broke a couple weeks ago um, is a, a timing attack that is actually practical. Uh, the good news is... Uh, Live streaming is on. We're good. Will the same stream continue? Yeah. I'm using the same key. Okay. The, uh, in August, uh, Microsoft acknowledged a uh, CVE uh, regarding net login, wherein a blank password would work uh, because they weren't using a nonce. Oh, uh, this was, um, Picked off as not our problem by most of the Linux distros. Yesterday announced on uh, one or more mailing lists, well, Linux has Samba, or rather SIFS, they call it now, but we still call it Samba. And that is bug for bug compatible uh, with Microsoft implementation of NetLogon. Uh, so at least in the older 4.76, uh, the exploit that has been posted to the net for attacking Microsoft servers works directly on Samba 476. 411 test is vulnerable, but at least the exploit doesn't work directly. Um, turns out Microsoft specified in the specification that the initialization vector for the AES Oh, was to be set to zero instead of a random number like it's supposed to be. Get random number, return four. Hmm, yeah, right, thank you. Oh, the Anthony's pun on the uh, Twitter uh, thread is uh, intentionally confusing IV as initialization vector with the Roman numeral four. So four is a better value than zero for the IV. Okay. We'll return you to our regular programming. Progress in RSA factoring. Uh, RSA 250 challenge has been uh, cracked only a few months after RSA 40. Um, which is a great speed up since RSA 230 was done a year and a half before. And they did the 76, 768-bit binary size known as RS 232, RSA 232, at basically the same time. And by the way, they cracked the, um, the, the discrete log uh, a problem of the same approximate size at the same time that they did the RSAs. <sighs> so prog progress just continues. As, as Schneier and others say, uh, as the NSA says, the attacks never get worse. Um, Debian 
hasn't officially given up on PGP keys. Um, they still want you to have one, but they no longer require that you have a pre-existing web of trust uh, on your key in order to become a Debian developer. Uh, they will now accept your previous signed contributions to a project uh, as proof of the identity of your key uh, in order to elevate you to DD level or higher. Um, the uh, there's other writings on why PGP is the wrong solution to the problem. Last year, I gave a list of alternatives uh, why a um, golden hammer shouldn't be used for everything possible, but use uh, particular tools. I refer people to that uh, for better alternatives. Now in typography, um, there are clear distinctions between classical, transitional, modern, and postmodern uh, typefaces. The, the irony of referring to anything uh, after uh, about 1780 um, as postmodern, because modern was invented in Paris in the, in the mid-1700s is hilariously ironic. At least in typography, at least in cryptography, uh, the postmodern period, post-quantum cryptography uh, is still theoretical, but it's actively being worked on. So uh, you're, you're here on the cusp between modern cryptography and post-quantum. Uh, tonight we'll touch a little on the post-quantum and then we'll go discuss transitional. Uh, what is transitional? Uh, it's uh, electromechanical or mechanical systems or electronic systems that are uh, between the manual uh, era and the stored program era. So 1935 to 1975, roughly. Uh, we've talked quite a bit about the Enigma before. Um, the uh, U.S. Army M209 used tactically in World War II was a Hagelin C-38 system that was basically a mechanical adding machine inside that had um, pinwheels and cage lugs uh, such that you could change the pseudo-random number generator that it was creating with a long period by combining the multiple wheels um, by adjusting the innards. Uh, and it was good enough for tactical communications. The Germans did manage to break it, but they couldn't break it fast enough for the tactical messages to be useful. Uh, so yeah, similar to the Enigma in that respect, uh, the Brits just automated systems such that the Enigma traffic was usable in close enough to real time and the Germans were using the Enigma for things that were a bit higher than tactical. Um, the, uh, I've also talked somewhat about uh, the other German systems that were teletype uh, compatible. Uh, Tunney and Sturgeon referred to as fish for both of them. And the US Army SIGABA was a, a similar uh, teletype uh, rotor system. Um, the transitional that we'll be looking at uh, further tonight is the bespoke digital hardware, which basically is a precursor to the RC4 stream cipher used in browsers. Um, and thanks to export controls and how long it takes to get things approved for military use, they stayed in use longer than the period N75 they should have. You know, people ask, what's this uh, quantum cryptography, post-quantum cryptography I'm hearing about? Uh, it's mostly not talking about using quantum computing for enciphering and authorized deciphering. The Chinese have done a little demo using 
uh, quantum entanglement of photons to um, send information via satellite. That's different. That's um, not what we're talking about when we talk about quantum cryptography usually. Oh, what the National Institute of Standards and Technologies uh, is running one of their bake-offs for is normal computer cryptography that is resistant to a quantum computing crack. Um, you know, probably have heard that uh, modern cryptography is based on NP-hard problems like um, backpack filling, discrete logs, factoring um, large numbers. The, uh, the problem is that factoring large numbers fall into a subset of NP problems that are bounded error, bounded error quantum polynomial time algorithms. Um, the BQP and the Venn diagram in the corner. That means that if we can make a general purpose quantum computer that can run Schroer's algorithm uh, faster than it can be emulated on a normal computer, factoring would suddenly become fast. This is a problem for RSA crypto systems. The good news is that the AES keys that we use RSA and Diffie-Hellman to negotiate a session key for, the AES keys themselves are not yet known to be breakable by quantum computing. So they're, they're in NP minus BQP that's safe. For AES-256, uh, the smaller sizes of AES are not going to be safe long term. Uh, if AES-256 becomes unthreatened, we can do the three DES type uh, three pass bootstrap that we did with DES to keep the life extend it. We don't have to move up to AES-512. This is good. So the Federal Standards Agency uh, and the German Federal Standards Agency have both started, uh, or even in the German case, finished evaluation of quantum proof crypto algorithms. The Germans have already uh, selected one. Uh, McEllis is actually a very old cryptography that wasn't much used, but at least was understood uh, for quite some time that just happens to be uh, safe against quantum computing. Uh, so that's uh, Germans have selected that one and the Frodo KEM system as their two systems. Um, NIST has classic McEllis in their uh, primary uh, third round contenders in the Bake Off, and Frodo is in the um, secondary group that are not officially in the third round, but if they continue to develop, uh, may get selected for promotion um, to finalist status. Um, and so there's a possibility we might even be interoperable. That would be nice. Um, and they've been at this for um, uh, four years now. Uh, they've already gone through two rounds of uh, competitive analysis, the proponents of each of the crypto systems try their best to attack the proposals of the others as cryptanalysts would, which uh, is the right way to evaluate crypto systems. Um, for the science fiction fans in the group, you might notice that uh, dilithium crystals is one of the candidates uh, for the uh, uh, signature capability. Uh, dilithium being a... Nice. Yeah. Um, it, it just dilithium was uh, a signature standard and crystals is a, a name for a, I think it's a lattice-based um, 
cryptography. So the signature module within crystals is dilithium crystals. It just works out that way. Um, they didn't plan that at all. Ha, ha, ha. Um, so they're going to have a virtual conference for the people involved um, next week. Um, and they're looking to have uh, the finalists as a proposal for public comment in 2023, 2024. So they're taking their time on this. We have time because the work to develop a general purpose as opposed to a special purpose quantum computer is moving slowly enough you hear about you know people having a 512 bit uh, quantum computer for sale that's a special purpose quantum system that can do certain quantum calculations but is not a general purpose unit uh, capable of running shores algorithm which is what's needed to start breaking uh, RSA keys. However, there's still things that we need to think about now, um, since we're probably going to wind up being uh, in a post-quantum future. I spoke a couple years ago about the uh, Venona project of the NSA, where they saved up supposedly unbreakable messages uh, that Russian spies sent uh, in the file and when they had spare time on the IBM card accounting machines, um, started running differences on them and found that the supposedly one use um, perfect keys were reused, uh, which meant they could break them. Um, and the uh, the assumption in the unclassified literature is the super large data center that the NSA has in the Colorado mountains is a massive uh, archiving system uh, to save quality encrypted messages that they see and can't crack now for later when they do have a quantum computer or more horsepower, some other variety. So if there's something you don't want uh, a state-based actor to read 20 years from now, you need to be looking at perfect forward secrecy properties of your crypto system today. And you may need something beyond uh, perfect forward secrecy. Some people suggested honeypots of nonsense as decoys to at least muddy the waters. Uh, a researcher at uh, Lawrence Livermore um, published both a popular article and a professional paper about keeping classified information secret in the future world of quantum computing um, and debunked uh, three themes or myths that run rampant in the popular literature. Um, quantum supremacy, yeah, there's an economic race for IBM to sell the quantum computers, but there isn't really a race for national supremacy for security. Quantum computing does not make all current obs uh, encryption obsolete. As I said before, AES 256 is borderline okay, and we can deal with it. Um, RSA keys, not so much. Uh, and uh, that's why you need to start looking at the perfect forward secrecy in the PKCS um, protocol that you're using to use uh, the RSA key to set up the AES or whatever. Uh, and quantum cryptography is not going to make a new better kind of encryption. It's just going to force us to, to switch to a classical encryption that's based on instead of a non-P problem to a non-BQP problem as the base. That's all. And the good news is uh, they have um, uh, 15 uh, going into uh, uh, round three, of which they'll pick as many as four 
I strongly recommend uh, looking at either the um, slide deck or listening to the HPR episode uh, in the mentioned middle left column if you have more interest in that. In a year or two, I'll probably provide this group a, a report on what's going on. And so now, into history. History has uh, some new insights available from declassifications in the last decade. Uh, we'll look at uh, shift register cryptography at a hardware level. And we'll also look at the timeline of the rise and fall of the crypto empire um, that is tied in with shift registers and recent declassifications. And this will be sort of a, uh, a braided discussion. The relevant code words are uh, Thesaurus, Rubicon, as in crossing, you can't undo this, and Minerva. Uh, the uh, Washington Post article that blew the lid off this in February uh, titled it The Intelligence Coup of the Century. The CIA read allies and second-rate adversaries and neutral com countries traffic um, for decades because they owned the private company that was selling them the hardware. This started when two of the names in mid-century cryptology, William Friedman and Boris Hagelin, um, became friends, uh, united against the Germans, one tied with uh, Army Secret Intelligence Service, uh, Signals Intelligence Service, I should say, and the other uh, with his own company, having bought out uh, the company that he'd gone to work with that was basically the com the company that was competing with Enigma in the late 20s uh, and early 30s. And they developed a gentleman's agreement that uh, Hegel and Crypto, or Crypto AG as it was reincorporated, um, wouldn't sell um, really strong encryption to uh, countries that were unfriendly with America. And um, suggestion was made that uh, the NSA be given a right of first refusal when Boris needed to retire and wanted to sell the company. In 1952, Boris, Boris is the guy with the two jugs of liquor there. That's a snapshot taken by Bill Friedman. The second photo is Bill Friedman, his wife Elizabeth, also a great cryptographer in her own right, and Boris's wife snapped by Boris uh, in Zug, Switzerland. The um, Boris designed a uh, update of his um, hand cranked uh, World War II crypto system uh, in the 1950s. Uh, that was extending the design to have a longer period and um, not be susceptible to the ways Bill Friedman and the Germans had been breaking it during the war. Uh, uh, and he did too good a job. Bill Friedman said, NSA is not going to be able to read this. This is when the NSA didn't exist, but it did exist. He just didn't know it existed. And... Bill complains to Boris, Bill complains to his bosses, um, and they make another deal. Um, the uh, Because it's unbreakable if set up properly, when they translate the instruction manuals into the native languages for each of the customers, they change the instructions to make it less secure. Eventually, some of the customers noticed that the cycles were a little short. Um, and uh, wondered what they were doing wrong. Um, so Hegel and Crypto, Crypto AG, comes out with a new version, the CX52M, uh, that has maximal length cycles, or what are called M sequences, hence the M, 
Um, but they got some help from the NSA on designing that upgrade such that they're very predictable sequences to the NSA. I would very much like to know how they did that. We don't know yet. And in 1960, they actually signed a formal contract, not just a handshake, um, where a CIA contact in Europe would um, handle uh, licensing agreement payments. Um, and Crypto AG agreed to have tiers of products of decreasing security for tiers of nations of decreasing friendliness. Um, and the things were going swimmingly. The NSA was uh, not only reading the traffic of everybody that bought used equipment after World War II that they kept classified that it was already broken by both by the U.S., the Brits, and the Germans, uh, but um, breaking everything that anybody um, bought recent hardware from the very reputable uh, crypto AG of the very neutral Switzerland. Um, if you think this might be a violation of Switzerland's neutrality, uh, yes, it is. So the CX-52M was basically an, another pinwheel lug cage adding machine, uh, just like the 1935-1938 system, just better. Uh, but there were also, they, they could see that mechanical was dead end and electronics was the wave of the future. And the way to do uh, similar long period random number sequences with uh, transistors were shift registers, uh, which, you know, on normal computing, um, you know, we'll just shift the register left to divide by two, shift the register uh, right to multiply by two. But uh, in abstract computer science theory and number theory, uh, if you feedback um, the output bit back into the um, newly vacated input bit on the shift, possibly mixing with it a couple of bits that are called taps, um, you can get a long random number sequence that's not very random. The saying in computer science that is adopted in cryptology that uh, anyone using a deterministic process to create random numbers is in a state of sin. The man who said this is von Neumann. Yeah, <laughs> we've, we've known for a long time that computers are bad at random numbers. Uh, but that was, that was the coming thing um, as the decade turned from 1950s to 1960s. Um, so Hagelin Computer uh, Crypto AG um, started designing their first um, set of uh, shift register based uh, digital electronics. No, no microcontrollers. We're, we're talking about uh, wiring a bunch of chips together by hand. Um, they were going to use uh, CMOS medium scale integration 7400 4000 series chips um, and NSA nicely offered to design the core crypto logic the how the shift register is used um, designed that circuit for them um, for their own reasons we're assuming this is a shift register machine we don't know that it's not officially stated uh, and, and it's not proven yet, but that was what was in the air. Um, that is presumably what they built. And I'll show you why we think that's what they built uh, as we go along. Uh, they didn't use the best digital practices. Um, every single 7400 and 4000 chip should have its power lines bypassed by capacitors. They didn't. That it worked at all amazes me. The first ones they shipped out were returned because they didn't work reliably. They had to tweak them and reship them. 
a few years later, Egypt and Italy complained that their cryptanalysts could read the messages if they worked hard enough. Um, so the dirty little secret was in danger of leaking out. So they cooked up a new version, which was modified slightly different model numbers for each client. So the 4605 uh, was the Italian version. And you could actually tell the different versions apart visually. Um, the uh, W key is in red in the picture here. Uh, that shows you that that's the letter to use instead of the space as you're typing a message in uh, because it's used very rarely uh, in whichever language I think Italian this one is um, and you just type two V's if there actually was a W you needed to spell the English language one the Z was read and you would type TS if you needed to type a Z this is kind of tacky but okay whatever uh, its internal key was typed in on the key panel after hitting the I mode selector, 25 letters, get it right the first time. I hope it let you repeat it the second time to verify. I don't know. I'd have to read the manual. I didn't. Um, and then you would type in an extra five letters uh, as the message key before sending or decrypting a message. And you'd get those from a booklet of the day probably um but that's up to your agency how to how to do that um and by the by you had to have the high security key inserted in the case lock in order to uh, reset the internal key so we're assuming this had a 12-bit or a 16-bit shift register such as is pictured at the top there we don't know but that's a guess These pictures, by the way, are uh, courtesy of the Crypto Museum in the Netherlands. They actually have an Italian um, H460-5 uh, in their collection. That's what we're looking at here. Two layers of lids taken off. The, um, the, the printers are for uh, printing uh, tape of the uh, clear text and the crypto text. The um, key things are the uh, boards in the uh, card cage. The one in the middle with the little red posts uh, is the key cryptologic board. And I see another circuit board behind the cage, and I'm wondering what's on that. So here's the digital board. This is from the 1977 Italian 5 model, but it says schema 475 upside down at the top by the Hagelin Cryptos logo. Uh, so apparently this wasn't changed, except possibly by the blue wires uh, when it was revised in 77. Um, and you'll notice there's a paucity of capacitors. There's a total of one capacitor on the board. That's terrible. Uh, the, the, this thing worked at all amazes me. So what do we have here? There's a whole bunch of flip-flops uh, in the upper right and in the middle um, driver buffers along the left but most interesting there's a seven bit shift register or ripple counter right by the bus fingers and if we follow the blue wires from it down and through a three-way NAND uh, we get to a 12-bit shift register ripple counter. Interesting. Don't 
doesn't tell us a lot, but it's interesting. The cryptologic board designed by the NSA um, is delightful. Um, those red posts are serving as fence posts for rail fence wiring. This is point-to-point -point wiring with uh, enameled copper wire, hand-strung, and stacked up. So they're not using traces on the circuit board. This means you can't take a photo and you can't take an x-ray to find out what the wiring is. Uh, so this board is a uh, clandestine copying protected. You actually have to steal the board and sit down with it for multiple hours to trace out the wiring. The guys in the Netherlands haven't done that yet. Eventually they will. Um, but meantime, uh, aside from the rail fence wiring, the other thing we notice here is there's an EEPROM, a window ROM, and the sticker covering the UV erase window in the upper right corner. What else is here? There are two chips, which are shift registers for a total of 16 bits of shift register. Uh, 10 bits of D flip-flop, um, a bunch of uh, basic NAND, NOR, XOR logic, uh, and drivers. Um, that The shift register, hey, there, there, there's the 12 or 16-bit shift register sitting right there. Um, there's also a counter here someplace. Oh, yeah. Um, there's a, a four bit counter here and two four bit counters down here. So you've got 12 bits of counter, but those counters aren't shift registers. So they're probably indexing the prom. I would assume that if the blue wires were updated in 77, somebody would have marked the board as updated. But that could be what the two X's in the corner are for. So we don't know. Another thing we don't know is what's on the ROM. And since this board um, is 40 years old, no, 30 years old, um, no, 40. That's 40 years old. Um, it's long past the freshness date of an erasable uh, UV EEPROM. Um, the, in any of those cells that uh, have started to self-heal are going to be hard to read. Uh, a stochastic process as opposed to a normal um, operating voltage um, binary process would have to be used to, to read those storage cells and that might or might not be possible which is unfortunate uh, we don't know how the e and i keys were combined and used in this we don't know yet where the internal basic key or the and the message key are stored or how they're clocked in uh, so there's a lot we don't know just from looking at the boards but it's given us some ideas. Um, but th this was the NSA's lobotomized uh, design. Um, taking a quick look at a more fulsome design, designed at the same time by a British uh, contractor, um, initially approved just for British and Commonwealth use, but was put forward in competition with a Dutch system for NATO use and selected for NATO use. Um, the Troll, a tapeless rotorless online system. So this would be replacing the, um, uh, the long tape OTT systems. Uh, this one uses a, down here, a feedback uh, the outgoing ciphertext is fed back into a stack of two shift registers. Um, 
and it says it's got some quarter element bits, which I think means it's using um, chips uh, to uh, detect glitches in transmission and provide error correction, uh, which is good because if you're doing ciphertext feedback or output feedback, uh, garbles will diffuse as well as um, plain text diffusion uh, so that everything after the garble is garbled as opposed to one character being garbled by one character line hit. But if they've got quarter bit chips on their very slow teletype, um, that could fix that. Um, and this, this thing had a max input of 75 baud. So if they were transmitting 300 baud uh, between sites, uh, yeah, they could they could um, they, they could fix some errors. That's good. Uh, they uh, initially the the two shift registers that were operating ganged uh, had a common factor of two between the length of the shift registers, and eventually they figured out that that was a bad idea. They lengthened the 30 to 46, still divisible by two, and then uh, made the uh, extension register 17, so it's a 47, uh, so that they're co-prime. Well, 47 happens to be a full prime, but as long as it didn't have any prime factor in common with 24, uh, it, which only has twos and threes, uh, it would have been okay. The image in the back, by the way, is the Canadian Foreign Office uh, Telex room that has like 10 of these Elvis BID 610 trolls uh, communicating with various uh, embassies around the world in the 1960s. So Plessy and the Brits and NSA understood that this is the sort of design that was required in 1965 to properly protect NATO top secret. Um, this is not what the NSA designed for the H460 or the 8460X. Uh, the boards that we just look at do not have enough bits of flip-flop or shift register to implement uh, something of this complexity. So we're, uh, we can already see that it was a, a weak design, which is what history tells us. The, um, between the time uh, NSA provided the design of the cryptologic board uh, crypto AG and Hagelin, uh, and when they shipped it in 1970, the um, an academic paper, uh, theoretical computer science, um, observed that uh, with a fairly short run of output uh, from a simple Fibonacci linear uh, feedback shift register they could reconstruct the uh, taps and the uh, initial value uh, of the shift register uh, working it backwards. It's an elegant little algorithm and initially nobody noticed that it was applicable theory. Uh, I don't know, but I'm guessing that that 1969 paper, when it was eventually read um, by somebody in the Italian uh, Signals Intelligence Service, is what enabled them in 1976 to read their own transmissions and get upset. Egypt likewise, or maybe it was translated. That's just a guess. They might have found some other way of cracking it, but they were upset. Um, so it was reissued in 77 with the stronger boards that we just looked at that still don't have enough chips to meet what NSA thought was uh, required for NATO top secret. The, um, the declassified Stasi files after the um, Berlin Wall came down uh, show that uh, Cuba 
had uh, sent the Stasi uh, their um, assembler program or some program that would read uh, H-460 traffic as of 1984, and the phrasing is such uh, in the uh, letter from the Cuban Major of Intelligence to the German Major General of Intelligence uh, that uh, reading H-460 wouldn't be news to uh, the Germans, but they might be amused to see how the Cubans were doing it, as opposed to some of the other items that were on offer in the same selection of diskettes uh, that the Cubans commented um, <clears throat> might actually be valuable to the Germans, meaning that they thought the Cubans had gotten there before the Germans. So and as we've said about putting law enforcement back doors into commercial crypto systems today, if it's if a backdoor is inserted uh, for an authorized user, the backdoor can be used by unauthorized users as well. And here's proof from history. Um, the Italians and the Egyptians found our backdoor into the um, H-460, and so did the Cubans and the East Germans, which means the Russians were there too. Uh, Inferences, um, we, we assume that the H-460 was generating a pseudo-random number sequence just as the rotor machines do and that they were XORing it with the plain text, um, probably generated from a simple um, single linear feedback shift register of uh, moderate size, uh, quite possibly uh, the uh, Berkeley Massey algorithm is uh, was known to the NSA before it was published. They are generally a decade ahead of the open source literature in mathematics, at least in the areas they care about. That would be about right. Um, and the uh, uh, the fact that the External and internal keys were limited to the same 26 of 31 possible characters as the text um, entered from the same 26 keys might, might lead to some, uh, some other problems that were exploitable. Um, but if you had uh, either two messages in depth or had a um, suspected plain text fragment, which we call a crib in the uh, historical context, uh, like crib notes for an exam. Um, if you found that crib uh, in the message, then you had a, um, uh, that would expose a bunch of uh, key that you could then run the BM algorithm on. Whatever trick NSA used um, to make the M sequence of the CX52M readable, which may have been a, a leakage channel uh, or may have been a um, picking a particular sequence um, that had interesting properties that we don't know about, uh, whatever it was, uh, since the same NSA mathematician was involved, um, the H-460 might have had the same trick reused. We don't know. We also don't know how the 4605 was repaired from the 460. It's possible some diffusion was added. It's possible a longer sequence switched to a maximal sequence, switched to 16 instead of 12-bit uh, shift register. We don't know. Uh, but since it since the cryptologic board has only 16 bits of shift register, um, its maximal period is the 65k. Could there have been S tables in the ROM for diffusion? Maybe we don't know. Uh, could they have extended the FSR with the 10 flip flops on the board? It's possible. 
but sort of assume that the flip-flops are needed for the finite state machine that knows what state the board is in and what it's doing um, as it goes through probably microcode in the ROM. Um, it can use some of the buck it can use buffers for some of the state. Uh, the buffer is being refreshed uh, by output of the uh, of the ROM, but the, the ROM is um, only eight bits out, so you don't get many bits of state that way uh, being refreshed from the ROM. So probably the flip-flops aren't extending the FSR. I, I was hoping it would be that, but it doesn't look likely. Uh, what can we guess about the intentional weaknesses? Uh, if it was a byte stream, simple XORing, there's none of that nice diffusion that you get with the output feedback. Um, and it's XORing bitwise, uh, if it's XORing bitwise as the Tunny or SE40 machine during the war was, um, then it's possible to attack a single bit. Um, and then the, uh, <clears throat> the the fact that the not all of the bits vary as fast as the other bits in the alphabet, and your hot letters are going to be hot in certain bits suddenly starts becoming interesting. And that's how Tunney was cracked during the war by Bletchley Park. And of course, the other problem is Moore's Law. When they designed this in 1965, what was a large sequence was not a large sequence in 1977. <coughs> so um, on the right is the H460. Oh, there's a typo there. That 406 is supposed to say 460. Um, the timeline on the right we've already discussed. We'll pick up the code word operation timeline on the left. In 1969, um, France's general staff uh, suggests to the U.S. that we partner with them uh, to buy out Hagelin and take over Crypto AG as a... Um, um private operation uh the u.s free froze out the french in 1970 boris wanted to retire didn't want his son to take over the company um and so the uh, u.s and germany federal republic of west germany uh via the cia and the bnd their equivalent organization uh bought out boris using nested shell companies, one of which is based in um, uh, Luxembourg or Liechtenstein, um, where the all the shares of the company were in bearer shares locked in a safe. So totally untraceable ownership. Um, in 1975, uh, the an NSA cryptologist signed in with her own name as opposed to a cover name at a design meeting, meeting with Motorola uh, and Higlin um, Crypto AG personnel, uh, demonstrating that, that they were in on the design. Yep, yeah, it's shown in the documents. 1977, <clears throat> the authorized biography of Bill Friedman uh, mentions the 1957 meeting with Boris Hagelin, the NSA asked Clark not to include that in the biography, but did not fight publication because that would be Streisand effect. So they just kept their mouths shut and they carried on. Oh, uh, in 1979, the uh, Hagelin systems were improved because uh, the 
CIA and NSA arranged for Hagelin to hire a mathematician who was briefed and in the know of what was going on. So he was uh, knew that they weren't supposed to make the best possible system. They had a problem with some of the staff, aside from Boris, not realizing they weren't supposed to make the best possible crypto system, improving the product without permission. Uh, and explaining to clients why you're re-upgrading their system after you already upgraded it uh, is difficult. They did. And here's the memo for design of a cryptographic fax machine uh, that uh, has the uh, non-cover name. The picture is not for the machine in question, the 4700. That's for a later machine, which is the an inline machine that your fax machine would sit on top of. There are no unclassified photos of the uh, Hagelin 4700 with a Texas Instruments uh, thermo paper fax printer. There are pictures of their thermo paper uh, teleprinter terminal uh, that's uh, around designed around the same time, but not their um, not the fax. But uh, as of last year they were still selling a 2013 upgrade of the uh, cryptographic fax system in their cryptofax product line continuing on the timeline a big breakthrough book in 1982 bamford's the puzzle palace was an amazing unclassified um, public book about the NSA. Well, the NSA was not entirely happy, but he got all the information fair and square, and he mentioned the Boris Project. In the late 80s, uh, the U.S. government claimed to have knowledge of the Iranian revolutionary government's um, diplomatic cables where they were um, talking about things. And in 91, there was a Swiss news leak that the U.S. had decrypted an Iranian assassination cable. Uh, so in 92, Iran arrested uh, crypto AG's sales executive for their territory and held them for um, most of or more than a year. Um, and his corporate bosses told him, no, no, but we, we, we weren't leaking information from your customer. No, no, though, we wouldn't do that. They lied to him. Uh, he's supposedly kind of bitter, but isn't talking. In 1993, uh, CIA bought out the German government's shares for $17 million. There was a massive expose published by the Baltimore Sun just up the road from NSA headquarters in 1995, four-part series. Uh, the, uh, the, that, that's still good reading. Uh, it it's, uh, was pretty much spot on. Um, the, uh, and the Swiss federal prosecutors found uh, no foundation, it's just rumors. Uh, and that's what Crypto AG said, and that's what the NSA said. They, they all denied it. Uh, on the ensuing decade, uh, the internet uh, chattering classes um, rehashed the old allegations without much new information. Um, but apparent uh, German newspapers were treating it as a known fact uh, that, that uh, Crypto AG was uh, a controlled entity by uh, one or more NATO countries 
uh, in the 90s uh, and the early 2000s. In 2014, uh, the uh, Friedman collection of papers at the General Marshall uh, Library uh, were opened to wider access uh, and uh, NSA's uh, Friedman collection was declassified, redacted. All sorts of lovely stuff there. And in 2015, the BBC ran a story saying the rumors are true, uh, comparing the Marshall collection redaction of this trip report memo by Bill Friedman from meeting Hagelin and making the initial gentleman's agreement uh, with the NSA redaction. And it, one sentence is out, one clause is out uh, saying what exactly they agreed to, but it's pretty darn obvious. Uh, but the last five years are even more tumultuous. In 2018, the CIA um, liquidated the company into two pieces to two owners. Uh, the Swiss government equipment uh, and the international equipment uh, became two companies. Uh, that is to say the untainted and the tainted are two separate companies. Uh, and the Swedish buyers of now Crypto International AG uh, claim to have disbelieved uh, the, the scurrilous rumors and have bought under the understanding that they were buying an, a, a, a perfectly fine company. And they're, they're a little disgruntled. <laughs> uh, and in 2019, Swiss Public TV um, went, you know, blew the lid off things uh, again. Um, and so in December of last year, the Swiss Economic Ministry suspended the new company's export license. And in February, the Washington Post ran uh, the intelligence coup of the century, which is based on a, uh, I think, leaked as opposed to declassified CIA history. I'll, uh, I'll tap dance until... Yeah. Streaming is on. I've also been noticing that the uh, the quality of video on YouTube really sucks hard. Mm, well, yeah. The um, I'll show the jury's resolution is two forty by one thirty five. That's probably why. Yeah, I hit the power button and shut some of my equipment. I didn't shut the computer down, but I shut the uh, action tech box down. My uh, camera down so okay so the um the washington post article <clears throat> was based on a cia history uh that uh, discussed their involvement from when the contract was first made formal uh to when it was liquidated in 2018 and that's what was uh, leaked to washington post so it's a very CIA-centered account. Uh, the Crypto Museum cooperated with them uh, on the report, and they've attempted to pull the discussion back toward discussion, discussing uh, the NSA technology as opposed to just the uh, CIA management of the um, buyouts and payments and... Uh, who meets whom, how secretly. Uh, so I, I do recommend uh, their video as a companion, as it's intended to be, to the Washington Post story. Uh, so in March, as a result of that, the Swiss prosecutors uh, opened a new criminal complaint and started an inquiry with a magistrate. And... Um, Several times, spring and summer, uh, the ministry uh, declined to uh, <clears throat> review the uh, export permit that was permanently on hold. 
So uh, beginning of July, they had a massive layoff. And after the last refusal to reopen uh, the export license, uh, they shut down the company. They applied for winding up what we in America would call a Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Uh, they did at the same time register a, a different Swedish, um, a different Swiss subsidiary of their Swedish cryptography company uh, in Switzerland. So their, uh, their new subsidiary of their old company of the new owners may pick up some of the work and people Hopefully not everybody is out of work, but the um, continue on with an untainted brand and uh, unconnected to the, the NSA. So that's what I have uh, prepared. If people would like to see a demo of shift registers in software and a demo of using shift register output for encrypting capital letters i can bring that up in the other window but frankly it's unless you like um bit twiddly code which a few of us old boys do uh it's boring as heck questions have you presented that before the lfsr no i, I may subject boston pro mongers to it since the um i did the encryption in Perl, even though i used existing c files to do the shift register And C is better for bit twiddling. I think Mad Dog wants to talk. Yes. Um, how practical would it be to put some of these encryption algorithms into an FPGA to perhaps speed it up? Oh, um, I don't know if an FPGA is the right class of customizable chip but uh, they've stuck some of the encryption algorithms uh, into the multimedia extensions on the recent uh, intel and amd chips already yeah but the thing is that an fpga it, it, most fpgas modern fpgas are almost as fast as a as a discrete asic in doing this and you could design a certain amount of parallelism into the FPGA without having to have all the rest of the overhead of the uh, uh, GPU itself. And that's why I was wondering if you've ever given any thought to actually coding it into an FPGA. Ah. Um, I haven't. Um, I'm not... Um... I'm, I'm a historian of cryptology as opposed to a uh, active cracker. Um, there were people doing things like what you're talking about, building DES crack boxes 20 years ago. So it, it's yeah, definitely something that uh, people doing that sort of thing do think about. Okay, maybe I'll... I mean, there's... There this is shankar i mean i mean there are some hardware already existing right so for like typical ssl accelerator type things the there are um offload engines um available already i think a lot of the cloud uh people use it because of the just heavy volume of ssl traffic that they have mm -hmm. so that's one example but yeah if you have a if you have a a very specific um encryption uh, algorithm that you would like to use then yes fpga might be one way to handle it at speeds beyond what um 
what the CPU instructions um, might provide. Well, one of the nice things about using an FPGA instead of actually creating an ASIC is that if you wanted to switch algorithms and assuming the second or second, third, or however many algorithms you want to try fit, you could reprogram the FPGA to handle that algorithm. Correct. Yep. So I have I have a connection with the University of Sao Paulo, and there are groups down there that are very interested in uh, encryption. So maybe I will contact them and suggest that this would make an excellent uh, master's or PhD thesis project. I've managed to do that before sometimes, and they've been very uh, interesting. Uh, the only other question I've got is you were going to talk about why this might be the last time for your uh, key signing ceremony, and I didn't hear anything in the talk so far to, to discuss that. Uh, no, there's a uh, slide on uh, uh, Debian uh, downgrading requirement of web of trust to you just have to have a key and either have a web of trust or have existing contributions using that key uh, and uh, the links to articles on uh, why I deleted my PGP key and uh, why why PGP is uh, the wrong solution to any problem. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that one. Okay. Uh, and you can see the, the long form of that discussion is in my talk last year, which is uh, uh, posted in the 2019 notes on the blue site. Okay, I'll take a look. Thank you. Okay, is that about it? Thank you, Bill. Thanks, Bill.